Welcome, everyone, to the very last session of the day. Um, for want of time, the session is divided into two. So we are going to have the first session and the second session. So the first session will be made up of five resource persons, and the, the second session will have um, separate resource persons. So without much I do, would like to invite our first resource person, Professor Claire Lucas, to please take a seat. Um, we also want to invite Professor Patricia Monzo Escalona, if she's around. Yes, and um, Professor Rami Ganam, please, if you'd like to have a seat. And maybe you can leave the middle, middle one for me, yes. Um, Professor John Mitchell. If it's around, yes, if you can come and occupy one of the seats. <laughs> and Dr. Garrett Thompson, I think I saw him around. He just, yes, he just stepped out. I know Garrett is around. Let, let's give him a minute or two, then we can make a start. So what is going to basically happen is we've been able to pile some sets of questions that we we'll ask the question ac across board, and we'll have our resource persons answer those questions. At some point, if there is any question from the audience, we welcome that as well. So we want it to be very interactive as we journey on. Looks like um, Garrett. Yes, Garrett, <laughs> right on time. So you can occupy one of the seats, sorry. OK, so I think we are good to go. Um, our first question that we, we have is from your experience so far, would you say that project-based learning has yielded the desired result so far compared to com conventional mode of teaching that comes with formative assessment? Would you say that project-based learning has yielded the desired result? Um, <laughs> I think it has. I guess it depends whose desire you are interested in, in meeting. Um, I think it has certainly engaged the students. It has um, delivered some of the things we were looking at, you know, particularly in making, making connections, and students, I think, are feeling the value of it when they go out into the workplace. Has it delivered on NSS results and some of the other things that some of my... Uh, erstwhile senior management are interested in, not to the degree we would have hoped to find. There's, there's both reasons and issues that have, that have led to that. Um, I mean, again, I think it depends what, you, what you're comparing it with. And I think we have to be careful of sort of saying project-based learning is a solution to all sorts of things. You know, we often decry the lecture, but there are some brilliant lectures and some people who do it very well, but there's also some quite awful ones as well, some things that are really terrible. So I think there's no one size fits all. And I've seen you know, I think as Emanuela alluded to in her talk earlier, we've seen a gamut of problem-based learning that achieve all sorts of different things, from the very structured versions that do some things very well but don't really expose students to the full range to you know, some of the things we do and some of the excellent things we've seen today of you know, really out in the workplace. And so I think you've got to be very, you've got to really quantify a statement on that and be very precise about what it is you want to achieve. Because often it's lauded as a bit of a panacea to all manner of things. Um, and it's good, but you can't do everything. Thank you very much. Anyone from the resource? So I, I can put a bit on this. We've just had our first cohort graduate that have come through this. And I think what we found is some of the best individual research projects we've, we've ever seen. So some of the best marks we've seen, some of the best report writing, the best reflection, especially looking at, uh, we have so-called professional issues chapter, which lots of you probably have similar, where you talk about all of the um, contextual issues surrounding your project. Um, alongside uh, some, some less positive exam results in the more traditional disciplines. And I think that's a puzzle that we need to solve. It obviously came at the same time as us going back between online and in-person exams, so I think there was other things. But we've done a piece of work where, thinking again in systems language, where you have emerging interactions when you have a system and you put it into the real world and you have these emerging things. We've, we've captured what we think are the emerging benefits of, of project-based learning that we can see. Um, and these are kind of observable things that we didn't predict, really, that they just came out afterwards. And one of the key ones there for us has been about um, uh, being able to deal with ambiguity um, and all sorts of 
facets of that, like not being afraid of ambiguity, um, being having quite an appetite for ambiguity, having the, the tools needed to deal with ambiguity. Um, and we've got seven of them that I cannot reel off the top of my head of, of the emerging benefits that we've found. Um, so I think as engineers, and you know, what's the most authentic thing we do is probably this third year project where we see them actually design and build something and test it and, and write it about it. Um, in an authentic way, we've seen them become engineers, but not necessarily engineering scientists. <laughs> so that's, that's our perspective so far. Thank you very much, Claire. Yeah, and you can also see, I mean, students who would like to go to a university where you actually have both hands-on activities and project-based learning, because there's a way to apply those principles that you have in classes on, on, a, on a project. So they, they do like that. So it has got, as John, uh, John you know, I got advantages, probably not advantages or disadvantages, but it provides a, a lot of benefits, I would say, for the students. Thank you. I mean, from, from my perspective, a lot of the points have already been raised. I think, I think it's, you saw my talk, the, the quotes from the, the graduates in industry and how much that had, had actually benefited them, you know, it's particularly from mechanical engineering where, yeah, you did lots of thermal fluids classes, but then you ended up in manufacturing and never used any of those skills at all. Whereas this was the, the sort of skills that students are picking up in these project modules are often quite broad based, that whether you're going into the water industry or power generation or manufacturing, a lot of those sort of skill sets can be can be translated and that's probably why we're getting such positive feedback from the, the graduates in industry. Um, from a program, program director point of view, it's also allowed us to place things in a naturalistic setting. Um, we're, we're all uh, at the mercy of the accreditation system and any tweaks and curls that that might take from iteration to iteration and it's often easier to address some of those points in things like project-based modules in a natural fashion rather than, well, you know, the IMEC here coming round, we need to put something about sustainability in there or need to put something about ethics or John, John, I'm sure ethics, you can get that into your, your material science lecture somewhere, you know, uh, in projects it can be much more natural because that's how you would encounter ethical issues in industry is because you're doing something in a project and something is, is cropped up that's, that's posed that, that challenge, um, not just by, by reading a textbook. So. Or even worse, putting a module on a Friday afternoon yeah. to teach all the ethics of sustainability yeah. and everything else. I have like a, an example of a student. I remember two of my students said that when they went for interviews to the industry, they were more interested. They know what they know, which are the mm. skills that they have, but they were more interested in that project-based learning that they have done. How was it done? So it really attracts uh, a lot of um, you know information for the industry. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, sorry. I yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Um, I, for me, I think one of the bigger challenges of moving into something like big modules, project-based learning, is fighting our university regs, uh, which are not typically created since modularization with these things in mind, and. Uh, I can't remember who said, but um, uh, maybe it was you, that, that uh, we are only allowed two learning outcomes in the module. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Now, um, so if, if your project is where you're going to pick up sustainability, to say health and safety, and all, all these ethics, then you're going to immediately run up with 10 learning outcomes in, in your project module. Um, so, how, how do you work around regs? Okay, I think we'd like to hear from Yeah, I'd also like to echo what you were saying. And, um, you know, in order for project based learning to be effective, you need well designed projects. And who are going to design the project is the faculty members. And unless you have faculty members who are incentivized and they're, you know, they, they want to do this, then it won't happen. So, uh, um, so I do believe that you do need institutions and you do need also staff members who are on board and they, they want to do this themselves, otherwise you won't have effective projects and won't have 
project based on the small talk. And how about cost? Because it doesn't come easy. It comes with some element of financial draining as well. So how have we been able to mitigate the cost as against returns in project-based learning? By massively increasing our student intake. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. <Is> your model? <laughs> I, think, um, I think genuinely the, um, the, the kind of hiring of staff um, who we've we've got a mixture of people who've come from industry, from probably from a CDIO background, other people from different kinds of project-based learning backgrounds, um, who are able to figure out scalable models. We've used a lot of, I think Emanuela was talking about design reviews, so we do design reviews as peer design reviews, so the students test and design test each other's designs. Um, so there are little things we've done, but the key thing we've done is. Um, the individual project is a simulation project. So we tried the first year to have an individual making project and then a group making project. And that was just to block, you can't have that many students going through a make space. Um, so by embedding that model-based workflow that we were hearing about before, um, we've been able to really kind of scaffold our design projects and get good learning in there from the simulation. So having the simulation first um, before they make something finally has really helped. Because that was the main, pipeline issue was the makerspace access and enough technicians and enough TAs that could keep that running safely. I mean, I think if you look at many of these models, I mean, you know, great models of Teddy and NMI that are coming through, but questions about how, how you can scale that. I mean, we, we started at scale from the very beginning. And I think you have to make compromises and you have to be you know, think about what you can and, and, and can't do in terms of delivering it. I mean, I was given the, the, the challenge I was set when we first started doing the IAP was that I really, I, I really couldn't expand the, the staff number. I mean, I was told that you know I had a few members of staff to help with the organisation on originally two-year contracts, so about ten years on, and they're still here. But to start, we we couldn't couldn't change the the, the time scale that much uh, on terms of the the workload. And I think there is there has always been creep. We've had to, we've used a lot more PGTAs and other forms of su support. So I think, um, yeah, you've got to acknowledge it's a different type of engagement. I mean, I must admit, I think I look at my PBL classes. I mean, one of the things we try to do with a lot of the scenarios is really cut down the assessment. I know when we first started it, we had horrendous assessment of these long reports. And the students have done a one-week intensive module. The staff have done a one-week intensive module. They don't write, want to write the report. I don't want to mark the report. We got rid of the report. We've, you know. And so actually, those modules... More, the, the assessment's quite light, so while I'm, you know, while it's an intensive week, I'm not setting an exam paper, which is a day of my life back. I'm not marking 200 exam papers, which is another three days of my life back. Actually, it's sort of, you know, there are some wings you can have from different forms of, a, of assessment and things. And I think to the regulation point, yes, that is. You know, I, th I, th I, I don't know whether I'm, I'm fortunate, but certainly UCL, is, UCL has things it calls regulations, but they're more sort of guidelines, if we're going to be honest. And if you can engage with the central administration and negotiate and try and work your way through them, there are surprising, surprising interpretations you might be able to, to find, has been my experience. It cost me a lot of coffees and a lot of lunches and a lot of... <laughs> You know, talking to committee chairs and trying to explain what we were we we're trying to do. On occasions, uh, that's a dirty word. Uh, gen yeah, gentle incentives. Um, but I think you know, I put my faith. That it's not always been repaid, but that, that they want you to improve their education. And actually, if you engage with the centre, um, you know, we have seen people do. You know, if you, things get sent back because they don't fit the mould. Um, but I would hope, you know, I would like to think most universities you could find someone that you could engage with this dialogue and, you know, and I had many conversations with, well, no, you can't quite do that. But would this, is this close enough? Would that work? Or have you thought about doing this? And, and those sorts of negotiations, you can push the envelope against the sort of identikit model that we seem to be forced towards. Thank you. Well, my approach was different. <laughs> uh, as you can see, so mine was everything online, so it was virtual mobility. So that could be another way of mm -hmm. doing it, and obviously the cost is very low. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. One clash of regulation and accreditation that we 
space is is about reassessment. So project-based learning is mm. is something that works really well first time through. You've got all your students there. It's something that doesn't necessarily work very well second time through. And working out your inclusivity or resets of, of project-based learning, how that fits with accreditation, how that fits with your university regulations, uh, without just inviting students back next year, is something that I think can be quite challenging. Thank you very much. Any question from the audience? Yes. Yeah, I'm just interested. Um, I mean, a lot of what you've been talking about is about curriculum reform. I'm questioning how, how tied you are to, to terms like project-based or problem-based learning. It seems to me what is going on all the time is actually rethinking the curriculum from uh, a, a, an alternative conception of what engineering and an engineering degree should actually be doing. Um, and that I think Emmanuel uh, uh, articulated this in terms of you, you're developing a model that's neither project-based nor directive instruction nor uh, problem-based, but it's somewhere in between, and to what extent this is a, a, a joint project in terms of engineering courses to be able to develop something that's authentically engineering, that has a kind of clear practicality about it in the same way that my old subject, youth work or medicine or uh, you know nursing would have practical built into, and all the problems you've identified are exactly the same ones that we all have with practical um, uh, modules. Um, is to what extent you're working with the fact that you don't have a a compulsory practical you must go to uh, site and actually how you, you build something that's as close to that as possible uh, within the system to whether or not you're tied to these languages or whether you want a, an alternative phrase that's something about the engineering practice uh, that combines the best of all these types of practical activities yeah I mean, it's just, uh, on, the, on the curriculum side one of the things that I'm always conscious of is, you know, the, the students that we are teaching today will retire probably when they're, they're 70. And no matter how good we are as educators, we can't teach them the sense or the materials or the CAD systems that they'll be using in 10 years' time or 20 years' time, never mind, towards the end of their career. And so maybe there, there is an opportunity to rethink the whole sort of curriculum where you're not so much thinking about uh, you know the, the textbook on the thermodynamics and the material science and things like that. There'll probably have to be a core level there. But going forward, the resources that historically you would have to carry in your head or your textbook is now available on the internet. So gathering that data is much easier now than historically it was 20 years ago. But the pace of change of technology and things like that is only getting faster. And one of the skills that we should be trying to embed in our students is the, the ability to embrace change, to be confident about going into a project, not knowing what they're doing exactly. You know, they don't have all the skills. They know, oh yes, this is probably going to need to use some weird material to get this done. I don't know if that exists. I don't know whether that's going to exist in a year or two's time. Uh, I don't know if there's something, but be comfortable to, to, to go into the problem and go, right, I'll investigate that, I'll research that, I'll find that out. Because you know that's probably the the life that they'll have when they go into their, their professional career is one where hopefully they're going into projects that they don't know the answers to because that surely makes engineering much more exciting. If every project was the same and you knew how to do it just like that, it's going to get quite tiring. But if you, every time you pick up a new skill, a new material, a new simulation technique, you're gradually building your resources through your career, and it's it's. You know, to, to think about students, not just us testing them for whether they know the second law of thermodynamics, but whether they can look at the, the tenth law of thermodynamics when it comes along in 2033 or something like that. Okay. Uh, I'm surprised Donald Sean did not be mentioned when he covered it 35 years ago. Yes. He spoke about the swamp roller, you know, and, and, and engineering architectural schools that dominate their technical rationality and positivism. I, I mean, I'm, I live that life every day because we employ engineering scientists mostly who mm -hmm. love technical rationality and yeah. So one of the issues here is, is, is COVID-19. I mean, if, you, if, if I've not read his book, you know, Educating the Life of Practitioner, you really need to start there because that, 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 that's, that's where it starts. One thought I had recently, which is kind of on this, was that the engineering hasn't been served well with the brand of STEM or, or STEAM. 
it shouldn't be part of steam or spec. Anything needs to go alone. You know, the school system might have been served well. Higher education might be served well, but I don't think industry has served well and been branded as STEM or STEM. I think that, that there's too many interlopers involved that aren't engineers that, that take the, the dialogue and the narrative associated with STEM. I don't know if that, that's devil's advocate mm -hmm. to do that thing. In response to the, the kind of point you raised about the, the, the definitions, I think there's been an interesting exchange between we've a lot of what we've talked about today, we've shown that we've replaced the design thread you might previously have had, with, and there's still quite design as part of that. And at the same time, we've seen design being taken on in all sorts of other disciplines, right? So business schools do design now, and schools are talking about how they do design differently, and that's not just about design and make, but it's... So I think that that's really interesting to me, that, um, and I haven't got a better way to articulate, that, that there has been this exchange. So we've spread design outwards, um, and we're kind of losing our grasp and ownership over the words design, but we're getting something else in between, and we've got to figure out, as you say, something in that Venn diagram, which we can maybe claim. I mean, I think there is an important point there about you know considering the curriculum as a whole, and that we, you know, we've messed around with little bits. I mean, I would love to say we had design threads we took over. Mechanical engineering sort of did. Most of the other departments, not really a stream, more of a few puddles once in a while of design that didn't really connect. And so I think, you know, and Gav talked about it at the beginning of the, the, the idea of integrated and CDIO brings an idea of integration and we wanted to bring a, 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 a integrate and try and design things across the whole curriculum to give, to give that broader experience. I mean, on the language, you know, I was surprised to find that social scientists are just like engineers and use words to keep other people out of their discipline, except you use, social scientists use words that we recognise. We just use acronyms so that we, you know they're weird words, but you use proper words, but we think mean sort of very fairy things that mean actually something very specific. And I think we've latched on to problem and project-based learning, which I know in educational fields mean very, very specific things, and have sort of just used them randomly in broader things and as, it, as they, they suit us, which, yeah, that, that, that's what engineers do with other people's disciplines, but that, that's fine. Um, so, uh, but there are all, all, everyone's coming up with new words. We've got collaborative problem-based learning and team-based problem-based. You know, uh, whether we need another word, but also I don't think we need to get fixated on them necessarily because I think you, you know it's what you know. I've got a bit of a reputation of being anti-lecture and pro-PBL, which surprised me given I wasn't necessarily anti-lecture. What I was surprised by was that when the answer to how I best teach this, the answer was all, the question was how I best teach this. The answer was always a lecture. I'd be just as surprised if the answer was always PBL. You know, as an engineer, we should know to pick the tool that does the job we want. And if, you know, if, if a hammer is the job, is the tool that does the job every time, I'm going to question my engineering skills. I, you know, you need a range of things, and PBL is one. And we still have a lot of lectures, which sort of I think plays to Mike's point of certainly when you're changing a curriculum in an institution. Yeah, you know, one question I get asked is, how did you get everyone on site? So we're 10 years on and I've probably only got half the faculty on side now. There's still people who don't want... But I had enough to work with. We had enough to get over the line to change the bits we needed to. And we had a model that allowed those that didn't want to engage to, to fit in it and do the stuff they did and not be disruptive to it. So, you know, it is you know, quite consciously a pragmatic model where we changed the bits we wanted to change to make a difference and left a lot of the other alone. And I think, you know, I was never that keen on this sort of diffusion model of, of, of innovation that you know, people will pick it up. But I think there is a threshold for that. I think if you change enough and start to change a culture, people do come on board as time goes on. Thank you very much. I think John asked one of my questions. So um, <laughs> change is difficult. So um, Gareth, how, were, how did you manage to carry everyone along, especially academics who have been used to the conventional mode of teaching for years? How did you convince them to agree to the fact that uh, project-based learning is the way forward? There were, there were some <laughs> staff who, 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 who bet sort of immediately and things like that. There were other staff who, who bet you know, uh, to my face, but then be, behind the doors, you know, I remember walking along the corridor the year that we'd implemented the project-based learning, and I I saw a first year student walking along the corridor and he goes, get yourself downstairs, you've, you've got project-based class. And he goes, no, no, it's been cancelled. He's replaced it with a lecture. 
<laughs> you know, um, yeah. and, and, and things like that have happened. We were, we were either fortunate or unfortunate in that we had a, 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 a relatively low staff count at the time. And through going over to project-based learning, that spurted our growth. So then we were able to recruit new staff and they brought staff in by and large with the mindset that, right, this is how we're going to do it. Um, uh, and we were also having to, to recruit at the, the entry level as well. So it tended to be younger academics we were, we were recruiting, maybe into their first post, who were perhaps a bit more amenable or malleable to, to taking on this, this type of role. Um, so that, that, that's kind of how we, we managed it. Um, you know, I, th I think it's probably still a challenge. We, we, we currently try and, whenever we get new staff, to bring them into some of the project modules. Uh, our project modules, as I mentioned, are generally team taught, so that, you know, it's not like they're going in on their own. Um, and I'm, I'm of mixed minds as to whether that is the, the best route, sort of long term, you know, bringing someone in, particularly now we've got a much bigger staff body to teach modules that perhaps they're not comfortable with and perhaps, you know, if you're looking at your, your man management or your women management, your personnel management, you put people into the, the roles that you can get the, the greatest impact from and perhaps that's maybe not always going to be the, the best role. So as, as John says, yeah, find, finding good roles for, for good people, even if it's not in the, the, the project-based field, uh, is, a, is a key, key skill if you're a programme director or a, a head of department. Would you like to? So, so something else that perhaps uh, to, to encourage people to uh, take these things on, these initiatives on, is mm -hmm. to um, include some kind of prestige to it. So awards the, the faculty members who design modules this way, or perhaps ref. So Mike talked about ref. Maybe try to convince EPSLC to uh, open up um, small funding, sort of small projects that uh, staff could apply to, where they could get some money for, for developing for developing these teaching innovations um, so I, mean, I guess these are some of the ways other ways um, also the institutions they could have um, dedicated tracks for faculty members who are interested in teaching and learning so in Glasgow for example we've opened up a dedicated track called the learning teaching and scholarship track for people who want to grow and excel in this area. So these are some of the things that institutions mm. can do to help incentivize people to work in this area. Okay, so we'll take one question from the I'm not a year of like, I guess, staff development. Mm -hmm. A lot of universities have some sort of PG cert or HEA fellowship pathway from the unit or any kind of Do you, do your institutions uh, promote project-based learning within the context of those educational courses? Do you talk to the education providers in the university or is it just separate and they learn how to teach in a sort of traditional manner and then what they are required to do in the programs are different? How does that work? I mean, at UCL is somewhere in the middle. And actually, you know, the teaching that they talk about in the, in the centre to a unit covering 11 faculties, and so it's quite... It's quite progressive, but in a very vanilla gen general sense, because it has to apply to engineering as it does to Scandinavian studies. So we've been working with them to try and do some engineering and also STEM-based sort of focus stuff. But I think that is one of the problems, particularly of large multi, you know, multi-faculty universities, that often those centres... You know, my own centre is now running a lot of run training for staff internally, more on the engineering pedagogy. Because um, again, it's something we, we sort of come to realise. We formed a lot of the teams of the enthusiasts 10 years ago when we were doing the change, but maintaining it, actually, we've had a lot of churn of staff. We haven't necessarily had huge expansion staff, but a lot of churn and people coming in and maintaining that momentum. I mean, one of the things that I think I got wrong when we were setting the project up is I believed I was running a change management project. I came in, I had two years to change something, and I would change it, and I would put it in this other place, and once it was in that other place, it would stay there, and I could go back to doing something else. But very quickly became aware that it, well, that wasn't the case. It needed maintaining, it needed building, and it was something that was going to continue and run much for, further. And unfortunately, I was able to keep the team, and Emmanuel and our that team, to, to deliver that. But a lot of it is about maintaining it, and which is in some ways just as hard as, as the change in the first place. 
Thank you very much. Any other question? Yes. Can you um, give some example of how widespread this is? Because everybody here is a bit of a convert today, aren't they? Yeah. Are, we, are we talking a small percentage of our university engineering education um, degrees here that we use a project for problem based learning? And John, you know, you say about it having a churn of staff. Do they go on and be advocates for? your system elsewhere and have you seen that being taken up by any other university in the same way? Um, certainly we have, yeah. Colleagues have gone to, to Yui, to Queen Mary and uh, 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 we've had colleagues move on to other places, um, certainly from the, the team and I think that's been great. Um, I wish I knew the numbers off the top of my head but there's a Royal Academy of State of the Nation in Engineering Education and part of the survey was asking how much project based learning is done and in what years of it, I'll, I can dig you out the stats now. It was surprisingly high. I thought, we thought that projects across the years wouldn't be as high as it was going to be. Whether the those that responded to the survey interpreted it in quite the way we meant, but most suggested that there was a significant amount of project-based project -based learning in most years of undergraduate degrees. My perspective from doing lots of accreditation visits is that um, there's been some other catalyst by which people have ended up mm -hmm. choosing project-based learning. And I think many universities have, have switched towards these kind of general first years. So lots of universities with separate departments have been going through this process, I guess, financial structure wise, of trying to consolidate their first year. Um, and that has often um, been a catalyst for, oh, we'll put some project-based learning in. So that's definitely what's happened in a, a lot of the universities I visit. Um, so I don't know what happens when you're already a kind of general school of engineering and you're trying to do something there. I think there was another hand up. Yes. Uh, I'll follow the session. I'm trying to think how can this be implemented in my country. So if I change uh, our education bodies are standing in the council, they've got strict guidelines uh, for the curriculum. For the curriculum. Uh, what I see in CDIO, I think they very fast. So something to go through that cost of change for the curriculum, including get their approval, and it's really hard to get that done. Obviously, that, that has to be done on a national level. That need a lot of flexibility as well. How has that been in the UK? How do the accrediting bodies do they? And how, how is it, does it work at one country, one body, and not full full systems? got normal teaching uh, system there and at the same time you've got CDIO or like Freedoms or talking about the system, the French super system. So how does all that work uh, in, in terms of the regulatory framework? Accreditation, and if you've got more experience please uh, show me down, uh, is very much based on, on, on the outcomes of the, the graduates. It's not so much how you go about doing things, is showing that the graduates that you're producing have the, the requisite skills and knowledge and understanding in the various different areas. Um, and as long as you can do that, you should be able to get the, the, the accreditation. Uh, there's sometimes practical issues about when you do it because you're, you're typically on a sort of five year cycle and trying to sink in when you're going to do your own uh, program overhaul in relation to where you sit on the cycle uh, is sometimes a logistical issue. Um, but it's, it's generally focused on on the, the outcomes rather than the, the approach and as long as you can show your approach is delivering those outcomes um, then you're you're generally okay. I, I found the accrediting bodies have generally been very positive towards project-based learning because it is you know practical, empirical, uh, open-ended, broad-based uh, learning. Um, and it covers a lot of the issues that, that lecture basic courses often can, can struggle with. Yeah, we, um, so I can't remember how many years ago, but we moved from content driven to, to out, outcome driven. And there was, uh, for a long time, the difficulty was that many universities were cramming everything into their project, their third year or fourth year project modules, right? So everything was done in the projects. They were claiming 20, 30 learning outcomes in those projects. And we were saying, but it doesn't exist anywhere else. So actually, exactly as you've said, that um, the accrediting bodies have been very keen to see these projects spread out more, and these specifically these competencies and learning outcomes. But I know that um, a colleague at, at Aston, Dr Richard de Lundin, is um, 
currently preparing with the IMECI and the IET some kind of guide for CDIO and accreditation, um, partly as reassurance, but also just reviewing exactly how uh, that process might work. Um, one of the challenges will be if you have a big module, as some um, implementations of project-based learning are kind of a single 90 credit module, for instance, how can you ensure that all of the learning outcomes you're claiming are being met? So it goes back to that same problem of trying to do too many things in one module. What we don't want to end up happening is that you just switch the problem that all of the learning outcomes are now being claimed in these modules instead, which are still only one module per year or something. So, in fact, Richard uh, is, 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 led, no, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> is, is led the development of our major final year project is now actually split into two, two different elements, one of which is the the professional skills that you would get by doing a project and he's also bringing in things like uh, professional registration as part of that module and then there's the, the technical elements of the project as a separate thing. So the project has actually been, uh, the students will see it as one element but it's actually being assessed as two, two distinct modules. This, uh, like, like, what, so what was the major thing then? Was it the influence of the faculty members who were teaching at the university and then brought it to the council or was something else? Because I'm still like thinking like about this question. So we have very major goals now. Right? But the, uh, the council compromise of like it has like, the same faculty members, so it would save this here. It will need somebody who was before my time. <laughs> I think it, it wasn't in Washington Accord driven. It was Washington Accord driven. To, yeah. to, move, yeah. to, to move to outcomes. I mean, at the end of the day, if you write down on a sheet of paper all the things that we claim over the course of four years to teach, we could write down more or less the same list as we had before. But I'd argue we teach them better than the students might remember them. That's the main difference. And some are now in slightly bigger writing than some are in slightly smaller writing. But the list of things it requires to be a mechanical engineer are still more or less the same. So on paper, the curriculum is more is 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 the same. It's it's organised and taught in a very different way. I think Washington Accord is also what uh, you need to get the Pakistan Engineering Council to look at because I think CDIO sits very favourably within Washington Accord. Mm. So if you're trying to change uh, an immovable body, mm. then see what they're interested in and Washington Accord. Well, they are already uh, recently with their sign in Washington Accord, but um, still the kind of um, boundaries that they have set, they're still there. So to dilute them, obviously, it will take time, but I just want to get to know that how, how this thing worked here, how so the world of Washington Accord that triggered it all. I think so. so. I mean, a lot of... A lot of... In, uh, accrediting bodies have moved to the out the outcome base rather than counting you know specifically you must have 10 hours of this and, and that sort of thing um, and I think that was sort of driven and it does give you a certain certain level of, of scope if, if accreditation applies it correctly okay so <laughs> well, we'll know the answer to this no, it's a question about whether the process is the same mm. for you as it is for us in terms of having accredited credit against your for us it's paper. So once your accreditation framework moves on, then you have to comply with that. But um, we do it through volunteer um, accreditors who go to different universities and accredit their universities. Is that the same? Yeah, way it is, and I've been brought through accreditors here. Um, yeah. 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 So it's more like you've seen by the same idea. It's more like you've seen, and uh, obviously, I, I don't know um, if in the UK. Uh, the accreditation is compulsory on the institutions to be carried out. In Pakistan, it's compulsory mandatory for all of the institutions to go through this exercise because it is as per the law. Especially if you want, you want more quality government jobs and you have the engineering council license number, they should do everything when they pass out, like after the accreditation process. Mm -hmm. It's not compulsory, but it's, it's, you know, if you don't have an accredited degree, it's going to significantly you know, impact the, the perception of your degree and, and students may struggle to get graduate jobs if the, if the employer says, you know, an, you know, a two one from an accredited uh, and, and another thing is that it's not only for having the decision number. Uh, I mean, if you like to open an institution, whether in public sector or private sector, you have to have 
the uh, recognition for Pakistan. Also, a lot of, in the beginning, you got to have the uh, sort of agreement with them. Without that, you cannot open the institution of Pakistan. We always have a slight limbo situation in the UK. If you start up a new course, you normally have to run through to the, please correct me again if I'm wrong, uh, run through until you have graduates output. So if you've got a three or four year undergraduate degree, you won't be able to get it formally accredited until you're starting to see some students out of there, um, which can be a little bit of a chicken egg situation. Normally the students will then get back accredited, assuming there's no problems with the, the degree. Um, but degrees tend to have to run initially unaccredited until there's a, uh, you've got outputs which are then reviewed by the accrediting body to say, yeah, these, these students are what you said they would be. So. In the UK, it's somewhat separated. There's a, the accrediting is, accreditation is completely separate. The Office for Students is the body that makes you jump through the hoops to set up a new university. But that's all about the process, not what you, what you teach. Okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, we are running out of time, but we'll take the last set of questions because I've seen her hand up. Yes. Um, so, the university is a very formative state in terms of the kind of engineering. There's a few hundred thousand roughly undergraduate engineering students, and I'm sure there's more. Um, how motivated do you think universities are in making sure engineers come through the universities? But then we'll go on to shape practice in the next 50 years. How motivated do the universities are to make sure those engineers are building in terms of the responsibility around acting sustainably, acting ethically, acting ethically? You know, how much do you think universities are motivated by that more prominent in the, the, the latest uh, accreditation guidelines and things like that. But I think academics, when you're, you know, you're talking about universities in the, the broad sense, um, I think academics on the, on the front line, the programme directors and the, the, the teaching academics are, are, are motivated to, to developing and evolving the programmes to, to make sure they meet the, these sort of issues, um, not just the, the technical issues, but um, yeah, the, the high, higher up, it's, it's maybe uh, lost a little bit in the mist. Maybe. I hope that we end up with an interesting situation where our graduates are really demanding about the culture that they go into in, in, in companies um, and that they are forcing change. Because when, when there's a big engineering accident or something, it's often the company cultures that are... Uh, but, like, nobody traces that back to, well, this is where you went to university and this is how you were trained. Um, but wouldn't it be good if there were like big engineering successes that you could say, actually, let's trace that back, and it was this university culture that shaped your mindset and meant that you stood and, and were resilient or you were disruptive or whatever it is that you need to do. Um, but um, obviously that would clash against general employability if you have all these disruptive students <laughs> wanting to try and get jobs and they're, um, yeah, they're, they're all demanding. You know, the, the Generation Z, is that what they're called? But um, they will take a, a, quite a big pay cut to be in a positive culture now in, a, in the workplace. And that's going to be a challenge for companies um, going forwards. Yeah, and I think we, I think it will come from students. I think it has, and it is coming not just in engineering. I think it's coming across the inst institutions in all sorts of subjects. A few years back, we did a part of a Lloyd's Register funded project. We did a focus group at Aston, actually, of... Uh, I think it was 30 students from eight institutions. And you know, talking about sustainability was going to be one of the questions we had. But in the very first session, the students were talking about coming to engineering. They wanted to make a positive change. And I don't remember, I think Emmanuel mentioned it, I don't have that memory of my student days, that being something that was you know, probably there. But it wasn't so, so in the forefront of the, the students', students minds. So I think... I think it will, but I think it, I don't necessarily think it, the action will come directly from the senior management. The words are coming, but uh, they have to, but I think the students will push for it. Okay. Um, thank you very much to our resource persons and everyone for participating in the first session. So can we give our resource persons a round of applause as we welcome the second panel discussion? So thank you very much. And with the second panel discussion, we have Dr. Freya Azamat. Can you please take your seat? Um, we'll, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We also want to invite uh, Professor Tufael to join us. Yes. Professor Bob Gilmore, can you please join us? And um, the last person was supposed to be the HEC representative. So I just uh, did a double vote. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine, no problem. She's not here. Right. So um, our, our first question is, in terms of um, assessing project-based learning, would you subscribe to us uh, considering pass or fail option as against other mode of trying to grade student, uh, let's say, from, on a scale from, let's say, 0 to 100? It's for me? Yes. <laughs> Actually, uh, I think uh, an engineer is supposed to be an engineer. I mean, it can't be a partial engineer, partial engineer, or partial non-engineer. So to me, uh, this has supposed to be a digital value, zero and one. So for that, I endorse that uh, the person, the boy, the, the student, would possess all the engineering education, relevant education, the principles he'd understand fully, then only he'd be able to do the justification. Otherwise, you can't say that that's this particular student can do the job, in the job or the project, he can uh, do it by 30%, the other one would do it 60%. So I think it has supposed to be a digital value, zero and one. And for that, I'd go for uh, pass and fail with, of course, certain um, criteria that where would you place your pass and where would you place your fail uh, sort of uh, uh, benchmark. That's what I feel. OK. Yeah. So I have a little bit different view. I think uh, like, you know, what we see in students when it's project-based learning and especially they're working in teams, um, there's like, you know, individual contribution, but there's a lot like, you know, sometimes students complaining that, you know, other people are not contributing. So somehow I felt they are, you know, driven by the marks and that's why, you know, they are saying, okay, I want to, you know, get these marks and they are like, you know, then sometimes, you know, not that happy with the other colleague, not due to the culture, but uh, attitude due to the marks. So I felt we actually stop sometimes creativity by putting them into the box of, you know, marks. So we can have not like, um, you can say, especially like, you know, very strict policy of having pass or fail, we can have a medium approach where we can have some, you know, uh, parts in our project-based learning, like the group work and maybe reflection report, which is not pass and fail, maybe that's more like you know a gray area where you can assess how much one contributed or they can do peer marking as well and there are some parts which are fundamental concepts they are assessed so i would go for like you know middle size you know approach which is partly like you know we have some components marked and some not marked as well because i think when it's not marked then they can actually have more creativity and they have less stress and they can contribute much more in easier fashion and they're not just you know going behind, uh, you know, hair numbers. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I tend to agree with the second speaker there, actually, mm. because I think there are so many different types of project-based learning, uh, and there are elements, not all of the elements that could be assessed are going to be included within each of the, the types of projects. We've seen such a diversity over uh, today's presentations. So I think there are some that would require it and some that you could just be a, a pass or fail. Okay, I think I missed a name from the resource person, Professor Alan Kwan. Sorry, I missed your name. Would you like to take your seat? Sorry, thank you. Yes, yeah, so whilst you are coming, we'll take your question. Yes. So, um, if, if you're not marking something, right, if, if you're not marking something, how, how do you engage with Because some of them would, like the top ones really yeah. right? So this is like a health right? So the bottom ones won't, the top ones will really engage, right? So the main cohort in the middle, if, if, if it's, it's like if you see students nowadays, especially in the UK, not in Pakistan either, right? It's more of a transactional sort of thing we do for it because the cost of them, they do their job, they do their thing, right? And then they come into study and you are asking them to do something, which obviously they learn a lot from, but they're not marketing, so they're not getting anything back, mm -hmm. right? So uh, students nowadays, like the way I've read, it's a big difference for students. So 
how, how do you reach them? Yes, they will learn. Yeah. Yes, you tell them this, but like what actually happened on the road? So I think my approach is that we are not like uh, not marking the whole project. We are thinking about some components not some being marked. Of the project, yeah. yeah, and some components have not been marked. For example, if you're on the design phase and you have put 10% on that, but I think in design phase the feedback is more important than actually getting the marks. If somebody is getting a constructive feedback to improve it, that will impact the implementation phase. Actually, you can improve there. So you will drive them that you will get a timely feedback if you submit the report on time by you know time pressure you can give. If you don't submit, I'm, I won't give you feedback. And feedback will impact the implementation probably. So it's like you know implicit way of like you know driving their objectives, but not putting them exactly you know pass or fail on some components. Similarly, when it comes to group report, you have to then you know see what's the group completion, what is individual contribution. Then you can see whether you you know you give them maybe some individual contribution marks, but not for the group one. Like you have to find a trade off where you can actually take off some stress and some you can say constraints on creativity. Because for example, uh, you know I have actually experienced that I lead you know work based projects in apprenticeships, and I put the project proposal with zero percent. I just said to them that you will be allocated supervisor if you submit. Otherwise, I'll not, you know, allocate you supervisors. Now they had to submit, but it was without any marks, and I got very good proposals actually. And they spent about two months in that. So I have experienced that even without, you know, putting marks, they are they are driven by something else. You put another, you know, sort of, uh, you know, benchmark to you know. But if they don't, if they don't submit the proposal, you're not giving them the supervisor, which is failing them on the subject again. So, Indirectly, it's more or less like you know, yeah. the same model where you are like marking. Yeah, I mean, like we have been uh, liaised with their employers. We have chased so them. Like they, yeah. That you're not marking them at all. There's no constraint, and then you're expecting them to come to do something. Which yeah. Actually makes them learn. And yes, you're intentional, yeah. right? Yes, whatever you're doing is correct. But the, the question is, do they really do it with all that is happening with their life? No, I think I agree with you. There have to be something to you know make them move. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be marks. That's my point. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be marks because marks, then you know. Yes, yeah, it, it will. Yeah, yeah, it will drive you to those, you know, boxes. Yeah. yeah. It's not so much marking or not marking. It's whether the marking is pass fail or a gradation between zero and a hundred. So um, it's it's quite a common thing in um, the medical world or uh, to have to pass something but not get a mark for it so uh, you, your dentists have to be competent in a certain practice but just because they're competent in the practice doesn't you don't need to know that they are first class or, yes. or a second class competency um, and that that's something we're trying to model as well um, in, in my my school um, so even in a subject like mathematics we're, we're trying to, to get set competency uh, assessment. So let's talk about a very simple uh, integration. Can you integrate or can't you integrate? If you can, you're competent, tick, move on, get to the next thing. Uh, and then when you are fully competent in these 15 topics, then you pass the module. But you've only just passed the module. Then if you want to do better than passing the module, then go into the exam and show us how much better you can, how good you really are. Higher, and, function, higher, function. higher exactly. So competency then is set at the pass level. So a student, you were talking about stress. Yeah. So if a student through the year have demonstrated the 15 core competencies, they know they're passed. So they can relax. But they don't want to just relax because they want to do better. Well, okay, show us how much better. Uh, and it's a, it's a very uh, medical world type approach to, to assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Laurie. Okay, yes. Um, it's, it's the first time you mentioned that you experienced the medical practices that show competency in the medical world. Actually, okay, we, we allow a student to uh, show multiple attempts at a competency, which is exactly what 
the medical world would do. Okay? Uh, but if after multiple attempts you still don't show core competency, then strictly you fail the module. Yes. You know, you, you, if you, you can't, and, and that actually does, so, now currently you do a math exam and you can ignore 60% of the syllabus and just be very good at 40% of the syllabus and you pass. Oh, uh, that means you, you actually don't know anything about more than half the module. Uh, and, and this is trying to actually work against that uh, uh, student approach. Oh, I think clear. Um, so, uh, at the risk of introducing a new set of terminology, I think um, we're, we're quite challenged by the emergence of, of micro credentials um, in universities, and these are kind of taking hold globally. So, it's very similar, I guess, to what you're talking about. So, the idea that you, there are kind of some core bits and pieces that you could learn, they would be the micro credentials, and then you'd be able to tackle something higher than that. So, are any of you formally thinking about this in, in what you're doing? Um, and, and especially using the online material that you have created, that you could then turn into some kind of micro credentials. Maybe if I can answer that. Our project is obviously quite a small project, and it's maybe more suited to the micro-credentials, so we've had preliminary discussions on it. Uh, we're not looking uh, at implementing stuff like that over the next year or so, but we think it could be a raft, one of a raft of different types of initiatives that could uh, focus on, on the different attributes of skill set developments. So we are we are starting to think about that, but we're not actually, we don't have it well developed. Anyone? I think in our, the, the formal thing would be to recognise it as, as a prior learning, the RPEL, uh, and uh, therefore you don't have to do certain part of the assessment. That possibly is again running against the regs. In, uh, um, I think you could do it uh, informally, but then again, if you if you have got this micro you've got you've done this you've got this bit of learning you've got this proof of credential why don't you just simply pass this bit of um, testing and so we might so although you because it's micro uh, although i think there should be a um, an incentive to actually recognize it uh, the the process of recognising it is, is probably just too big for a university uh, programme, unfortunately. Okay, so we'll take another question. Sorry, I'm pretty sure asked the question because I'm not in the level of this session. I'm very sure she's been a lot. Just from Dr. Freehold, you mentioned that you separated the skills, behaviours and knowledge from your module, which is a really interesting idea to me. That's all very where that idea came and then about assessing these separate concepts. Do you assess behaviours different from knowledge or yeah. and then uh, maybe not really quick one, who defines what behaviours we expect from the juniors? Okay. What knowledge we expect? Do you have you done any research or it's just your so basically this terminology, knowledge, skills and behavior is very much, we can say, bread and butter for degree apprenticeships. For degree apprenticeships, when you will open any apprenticeship standard, which is already published on national website, which is Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. So there are a set of standards there. If you look any standard, basically it's a document which is developed by consortium of companies. So like, for example, if I'm leading digital technology solutions apprenticeship, it's developed by 15 companies including Tata, including Talis, and they have come together and think about what are the knowledge, skills, and behavior my employee want in the next 10 years or next 15 years. They come together, they develop that sort of like very clear terminology. So when you look to apprenticeship standard, they say knowledge, 12 points, skills, these 12 points, and they're informed by the employers. And then behavior as well, which is about negotiation, you know, competency, com communication, that's like about 12 points. So what we do in apprenticeship is then, in our you know university education, we teach them obviously knowledge as traditional, but also as part of like hands-on learning, project-based learning, we teach them skills that's assessed. 
Our learning outcomes are mapped to knowledge and skills. But behavior is something which you can't assess directly within your you know, university or workplace. So for that, what happens is there's a portfolio developed by apprentice where there are different you know, people giving references about apprentice that that person has worked with me in this situation and showed competency in this, this behavior. Or apprentice tells about the project they conduct in the workplace and they are used, you know, negotiation. So they actually attach a meeting minutes that I created this meeting minute. I negotiated with five, you know, different employers. I took the requirements. So there's evidence for the behaviors illustration. And with that portfolio assessed in the end, actually you're assessing the behavior. You're not giving the marks. You're trying to again, you know, check competency. Whether that person is competent in behavior, is good in behavior or bad in behavior, or like, you know, it needs an improvement. Until and unless behaviors is illustrated, skills and knowledge is illustrated, we don't allow apprentice to go towards the final point in apprenticeship. Even they pass their final year project, they can't go to endpoint assessment if all this list is illustrated by different sorts of evidence. So it's informed by the companies, that's your question, like that's your answer, and then it's done in you know different creative ways with the help of employer and university. Okay, thank you very much. Our time is up, but before we go, do you think that um, giving our students three months is enough time to test their engineering capabilities? Just for me? Yes, for, for, for the resource okay. persons. Do you think that the three months that is often given to students as a timeline for project-based sort of activities is enough to test their engineering capabilities? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly speaking, uh, because it depends upon uh, at what level you are having this thing been introduced. Now, for example, um, and, and of course, the level of the, the, the project that you're talking about. If a fresh student comes in the first year, Right, and um, if a three months is given, it depends upon if uh, the project that you're talking about is of that level, he can uh, do it. And similarly, as the, the student goes in the, in the subsequent semesters, um, in certain stages, he or she would require extra amount of time. But I think uh, it, it varies uh, uh, depending upon the on project uh, and the capacity and the capability of the individual. Thank you very much, Prof. Tafail. Would you like to? We, we have, so three months is like one semester. Yeah. We, we have both. So we have year-long projects, and we also have single semester projects. It all depends on whether your three months is full-time, or do you have other modules running alongside as well. Uh, so in year-long, then you have other modules running along. It gives students more recovery time and a more reflective time. Um, but, of course, they're also needing to do other things with the, 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 the time. Uh, so it really depends on the subject area that yeah. they're also looking at. Uh, yeah. OK, so our time is 5 o'clock. Uh, can we give our resource person a round of applause? Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, so all too soon, we've come to the end of our workshop. We'd like to say a very big thank you to the leadership of engineering here at Keynes and to the organization team, to the project partners, and to our resource persons who traveled all the way from Scotland to Cardiff to different parts of UK to honor our invitation. We are very grateful. And to our project partners also traveling from Pakistan, we are very grateful for honoring our invitation as well. And finally, to you, in spite of all the news, the cancellation, you still decided to beat the odds and join us. So we are grateful. We wish you safe journey to your various destinations and see you all next year. Bye for now. Thank you.